Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Well, we have uh, discussed so far what are the kinds of uh, the efforts which is normally being seen in the context of uh, human ecology, ecological anthropology, and how they try to represent the maxims of uh, human interactions with their environment. Uh, in this lecture, we are going to see something slightly different from what we have been discussed in the previous lectures and uh, we will try to locate and understand uh, how uh, nature and culture is being perceived in the domi domain of academia and more, more importantly uh, why nature and culture is uh, closely examined by many of the anthropologists and uh, we will be looking at uh, some of the works of uh, uh, the French anthropologists like Levi Strauss and also uh, the critique which is given by Stratton and, and for long this nature and culture these two concepts has been a contested concept and which is also closely examined by uh, Latour. Uh, but I won not be uh, touching on that aspect of what Latour has uh, argued or looked at. But one thing is very clear and evident that how modernity in essence also has posed a threat or if not uh, has reconceptualized uh, the idea of what nature is. And uh, in the modern development context, nature in a sense is seen to be something different from what it used to be in the uh, earlier times. So, therefore, it is important to look at you know, what nature and culture is and how it is being perceived across uh, different uh, perspective. Now, before going on to uh, the understanding or the debate which evolve around nature and culture, uh, let us familiarize ourselves with some of the basic concept uh, of why nature and culture is uh, seem to uh, seem to refer different things. And uh, most often time it, it is divide which exists between the two is also because of uh, a theoretical foundation which is formed in the context of the discipline of anthropology because uh, earlier many of the anthropologists in fact uh, attempts to uh, bring a theoretical insight from the per perceived uh, differences between these two that is between nature and culture. Now, what then is nature? Nature in the very general and broader sense is the natural physical or material world or universe. And also nature can be referred as uh, referred to the phenomena of physical world and also to the life in general. Now, this study of nature is in fact a large part of science. Science, the natural science normally uh, tends to uh, engage in uh, studying or looking at nature in a more uh, close uh, aspect. Now, what then is culture? I have uh, partly explained 
the conceptual definitions of culture in uh, uh, some of the uh, lectures in the previous uh, slides. Now, but then to familiarize ourselves and to engage in more in depth understanding, we will just quickly look at the, what culture is and what it means to a community. A culture in essence is a way of life of a group of people. Now, what is this way of life of a group of people? It consists the behavior, beliefs, values, symbols that are accepted by other members of the community. And this sort of practices that is the behavior, belief, values and symbols are passed on from one generation to another which is usually handed down uh, orally, it is communicated orally and uh, it is more or less based on a uh, kind of imitation what is bring uh, sort of uh, learned as a part of uh, a socialization process. And also culture can be defined as uh, how a group of people to identify them as separate, separate from other cultural groups and also how they tend to uh, sort of um, group themselves or form some kind of an association rather or associate or uh, that communitarian feelings of a people is being formed in this context. Now, what are the, this trait of differencing uh, one group from the other. There can be certain uh, <coughs> traits like language, dress and also ritualist, ritualistic practices or maybe ceremonies depending on the kind of what one celebrates. And also there are uh, traditions of this uh, storytelling that is usually being handed down. Uh, from the period of the ancestors. Now, these are some things which also are the cultural trait which defined a group of people uh, in, in, in trying to uh, make sense of what they actually uh, are. And uh, we can in a sense uh, use the term called cultural identity in trying to explain this. And also uh, culture is mm, partly a symbolic communication because uh, in symbolic communication they can be uh, verbal and non-verbal, they can be gestures and also there can be sort of objects which are being used in order to communicate. Now uh, Levi-Strauss uh, talks about the use of this metaphor. Now, how this metaphor is being uh, decoded or understood by uh, the person to whom that uh, message is being conveyed. Now, this sort of metaphor uh, which is being used in a particular community or society could only be understood if uh, it has to be understood in that particular context. The meaning has to be decoded in that particular context. Therefore, this in order to have a symbolic, uh, effective symbolic communication or uh, to have uh, an effective understanding, it is important to understand things in its very context. Now, moving on, what is this uh, nature and culture divide or what is the difference between nature and culture. Now, nature and culture uh, for quite long or if not uh, have been seen as an opposing opposite ideas and uh, what actually belongs to nature cannot be the result of human intervention or in other words, uh, human cannot really afford to understand or uh, intervent uh, in the context of what nature, what belongs to nature. 
And on the other hand, uh, this sort of culture development is seen to be achieved against nature. Now, for instance, the kind of uh, development which we all normally talked about or maybe let us say civilization is seen to be something uh, opposing to what nature is. Because uh, some way or the other we will be engaged in uh, bringing uh, destruction if not harmful effect to nature. Therefore, any kind of uh, move for example, cultural development or maybe any kind of economic development is seen to be uh, achieved generally uh, as against nature. Now, if one tries to look at the kind of uh, evolutionary development of humans. Now, in this aspect, uh, the evolutionary development of human, it suggests that culture is uh, seen as part and parcel of the ecological niche within which our species thrive that is the human or maybe other species thus rendering uh, in a way uh, culture as uh, an important place in the biological development of a species. Now, why is this what is this ecological niche and why is ecological niche important for a human to thrive or if human uh, to sort of exist as part of this biological development of species. Now, as we had earlier discussed uh, sort of the evolutionary uh, perspective which were developed by uh, Charles Darwin, Herbert Spencer, so on and so on. We have sort of witnessed the kind of uh, development which is seen in the context of human society from simple to more uh, modernized if not a complex form. Now, similarly, uh, why is mm, this possible or if not what is the kind of uh, impact which is usually seen in the context of uh, culture in an ecological niche. Now, what is this ecological niche and why is culture seen as part of this? Uh, because the ecological niche is uh, the environment or the habitat, the geographical space where we human in essence exist. Now, to put uh, precisely or in, in a more apt manner, we can say that uh, in the environmental determinism, we had uh, discussed how the environment in essence determined uh, human uh, to a large extent or maybe the kind of culture, the economy aspect, everything is in a sense being determined by the environment. Now, going by that, to some extent, uh, we human uh, also is pretty much influenced by the uh, geographical space or the ne ecological niche which where we belong to. And as I give an example here, as the snails carries their cell along, we all human also bring along uh, our culture. Now, in, in the place where we sort of uh, reside. Now, there will be a long sort of history of uh, engaging upon how this culture develop, but then the idea is to look at the continuity and change of culture. By saying so, we do not mean to say that culture is static, but there is a continuity in change in every aspect of culture that it may be the behavior, the kind of beliefs and then so on and so forth. Therefore, this cultural transmission is also uh, known or seen to be horizontal that is uh, among the individuals within the same generations 
or also it can be among the individuals belonging to different populations. So, this transmission of culture is uh, taking place in a more horizontal manner. Now, what is this cultural environment? A cultural environment again is uh, a set of beliefs and practices, customs, behaviors that are found to be common to uh, every individual that is living within a certain population, within a certain ecological niche again. Now, the cultural environment in a sense shapes the way how an individual develop. Uh, also, it also influences the ideologies and personalities of uh, those members of the society. Now, again, uh, what is this uh, meaning and nature of culture? It is not nature and culture, but the nature of what culture is. Culture is an aggregate of uh, the learned beliefs, attitude, values, norms and customs of a society or group of people shared by them and transmitted from generation to generation within that society. And uh, also, as I said, uh, culture is not static and it changes with time. Then, uh, what is the meaning of uh, social culture? Uh, similarly, uh, it, it is again uh, the kind of beliefs and customs or practices and behavior that exists uh, within a population. And uh, it also include an examination of the socio-cultural environment prior to entering their target markets. Now, we generally talk about the kind of socio-cultural practices, uh, which is normally uh, being seen in the context of uh, different human communities and what is this socio-cultural practices and what does it include. Uh, in, in, in general parlance, it is also uh, seen to be in regard to the traditional and customary practices of a particular ethnic or other uh, cultural group. Now, in a broader sense, this term can apply to any person manifesting any aspect of uh, any culture at any time. Now, as I said, uh, culture is also uh, symbolic communication and what is the meaning of symbol in culture? Human uh, cultures use symbols since uh, sort of the beginning of human uh, society as they move on and develop. And even in the simplest society, they use these symbols. Why? Because to express certain specific ideologies and the kind of uh, social structures and also to represent aspects of their specific culture. Now, symbols in a sense carries uh, different meanings that depend, on, uh, that depend upon one's cultural background. And in other words, the meaning of symbol is not inherent in the symbol itself, but is culturally learned. Now, therefore, a symbol cannot be something which, which, which is observed and understood by an outsider without really knowing the cultural background of those uh, communities. Now, for example, uh, if I may give a uh, sort of an explanation further of uh, agriculture practices which usually happened in agriculture. There are also cultural method which involve in these agriculture practices to enhance the crop and livestock health and prevent weight based problems without the use of chemical substances. Now, these cultural methods can be different and I won't go in deep detail at this point of time. Now, we are coming to the main point that is how these uh, dialectics if not uh, the contested ideas uh, which exist between this nature and culture is to be understood or what is the relationship between nature and culture. 
and, and, and why is there so much increasing attention, if not in academia, to try, try to sort of understand? And for this particular course, uh, how has, in a sense, the anthropologist theorized uh, this relationship between nature and the culture? And why has nature or culture been such a central and uh, contested conceptual uh, peer in the discipline? Why is it given so much importance? Uh, and the relationship between nature and culture has been a common and contested theme in the discipline due to the argument of where as to whether the nature culture dichotomy is given universal or a constructed reality relative to one's own culture. Now, this is perhaps uh, one of the starting point of why this nature culture is uh, given so much importance or the dichotomy is given so much importance. Now, looking at the works of uh, Susan Ortner. Now, what uh, Susan Ortner observed is that much of the creativity of this anthropology derived from the tension between the demands of the demands for explanation of human universals on the one hand and cultural particulars on the other. Now, this sort of the universal and the particulars uh, is sort of uh, being responsible for this kind of uh, the tension which arises. Mm, and, and normally, and this sort of attempts to explain, in a sense, uh, uh, Susan tries to posit in order to make sense uh, or the starting point of what nature and culture debate is. Now, how does the anthropologist perceive uh, the difference between nature and culture? And uh, we will try to, as I said, we will try to look at some of the works of uh, Levi Strauss, a French anthropologist, and uh, he actually uh, published uh, his work on the savage mind, wherein he tries to look at uh, the sort of dichotomy between a concrete science and uh, the science of primitive people or the primitive society. And uh, it is a very interesting work, and then he follows the structural functionalist perspective or more of a structuralist. Uh, Levi Strauss today is seen to be uh, following more of a structuralist uh, in his structuralism in his explanation of different uh, societies and communities. Now, he Levi Strauss was quite firm when he argued the sort of divide which exists uh, between nature and culture. Uh, only two models, where I quote only two true models of concrete diversity, one on the plane of nature, namely that of the diversity of species, that is uh, the diverseness of species, and the, on the other hand, that is the cultural plane which provided by the diversity of functions. Now, this sort of uh, things which he looked at, one is the functions and on the other hand is the species. Now, which he tries to look at, that is the, he tried to begin with his, the argument of dividing between what nature and culture is. Now, according to uh, Levi Strauss, again, the sort of symmetry postulated between this nature and culture involve the assimilation of natural species on the cultural plane. Now, how, how is this to be looked at then? How is this natural species uh, to be assimilated on the cultural plane? And then who is and uh, what is this natural species he is referring to? Uh, in his work, as I said, in the savage mind, uh, reflects that the discipline expansion of uh, nature, culture debate 
way back in the 60s and 70s include the idea that women uh, could be sort of symbolized as nature and men as culture. Now, in, in, in a sense, uh, we can see this as a more of uh, essentialist approach to understanding of nature and culture or if not uh, the gender divide between men and women. Now, uh, what the essentialist school of thought talks about in trying to understand this gender division is because of their biological uh, structure and biological responses, uh, human tends to, you know, like uh, sort of hold a position if not the status is being accorded accordingly. Now, essentialism uh, strongly talks about uh, women as a weaker sex because of their sort of uh, pre uh, conceived notion or ideas of what a woman should be and, and sort of seem to be more of uh, nurse and engaged in nurturing and caring and, and therefore they are seen to be something which is uh, inferior to men. Now I'm just partly trying to throw back uh, reflect the ideas of what the school of uh, this essentialism if not essentialist uh, looked at this sort of division because as uh, which is rightly pointed out by uh, Levi Strauss when he talks about this the expansion of this nature and culture way back in 60s and 70s and wherein he tries to include the idea that women could be symbolized as nature and man as culture. Why? Because uh, in essence the uh, women is equated with nature and they are seen to be something which is being uh, inferior or weak wherein uh, man is seen to be much more uh, uh, which has an overriding power over nature that is women. So that sort of uh, essentialist idea is being reflected here. Now by Describing these women as sort of uh, biological individuals was uh, not adequate for Levi Strauss as he argued they were actually uh, sort of a byproduct of the nature or natural products which are naturally procreated by sort of other biological individuals. Now, uh, Levi Strauss don't doesn't stop here. He continued. Uh, with his comparison as women to objects and also he ten tends to sort of differentiate them from goods and services which he described as manufacture objects or operations performed by means of techniques and manufacture objects that is social products culturally manufactured by technical agents. Now, in a way, uh, it is pretty clear that how women is sort of being compared to objects. Objects is something which is being tamed, molded and then created if not manufactured according to the kind of uh, the requirement. And who is this uh, technical agent stamped? It is in some way it is the man who in a sense mastermind in trying to sort of engage in these sort of operations. Now these natural products which are naturally procreated by other biological individuals, these other biological individuals again is the man. Now before going here, I, I, I would like to sort of uh, talk about the kind of uh, since we talk about objects and goods. I will try to inject some ideas which we of course will uh, deal with it in a later part of the discussion when we talk about this environmental ethics. There is uh, a sort of a school of thought again uh, which belongs to the uh, eco-feminist and uh, within this eco-feminist there is a division which are pretty much more inclined to the uh, 
uh, Marxist eco eco feminist, and this the eco feminist which subscribes to the Marxist understanding of uh, the economic production again tends to uh, come up with uh, an idea, if not an argument, that women is usually being doubly exploited by men, or if not in general. How? Because uh, when they give uh, an example about the agricultural community, usually apart from the agricultural activity, women also engage in some additional uh, household if not the domestic course like uh, cooking, caring, nurturing, but which uh, in a sense remained unaccounted. And uh, similarly, see in a way uh, sort of uh, do the kind of uh, work uh, in, in, in same with uh, her counterparts that is the man. Now, therefore, but uh, that sort of when the agriculture productivity is being uh, uh, sort of looked at the kind of ownership which is being attributed. Now, the women does not really have sort of a say and that sense of ownership is not being given. Now, over here that sort of alienation which Marx talks about in the context of the industrial society, wherein the workers has given their uh, uh, sort of heart and soul if not uh, much the best part of their life. But then at the end of the day that sort of the final product when it is being produced is owned by the uh, capitalists and these factory workers in a sense are being sort of distanced or alienated from the products which they have produced. Now, similarly uh, the eco feminists if not uh, the Marxist uh, feminists uh, tends to see how women are being doubly exploited by men and, and therefore this sort of objectification or uh, measuring women as something as goods needs to also be looked at uh, this uh, sort of uh, a different lens or in a different uh, perspective not just by what we have uh, discussed in the context of uh, what uh, Levi Strauss tries to maxims or how because it seems to me that uh, this sort of uh, objectification or differentiation which is being measured between men and women if not nature and culture seems to be uh, still pretty much soft, but in a very radicalist way if you put it the kind of economic production which is being perceived by the uh, feminists who are inclined to Marx and also Marx himself in trying to understand the kind of exploitation and alienation which exists in the uh, industry or the indus industrial society or capitalist society perhaps seems to be uh, sort of uh, worthwhile for us to have uh, a provoking thought in terms of this. Now, uh, continuing what uh, Strauss is, uh, what he tries to look at is the principal differences which uh, he sort of concluded is that one thing is derived from culture and the other from nature. And what Levi Strauss writes of culture's uh, sort of dominance over nature, that is how in a sense men dominate over women and uh, how this culture dominance over nature when he states that nature in a sense considers women as homogeneous, but culture asserts them all to be subject to the same type of beliefs and practices because since in the eyes of culture they have this common feature that man has the power to control and increase them. Now, this sort of uh, the patriarchal uh, mentality or mindset 
which in a sense is also uh, to be challenged. Now, by saying so, we are not generalizing that this sort of idea uh, or this intention of common feature that man has the power to control and increase them, that sort of perspective which is uh, seen in the context of uh, nature cannot be generalized between again there has to be a division in terms of what the northern countries perceive nature and the southern countries uh, looked at nature, how they try to relate themselves with nature is different again. Now, this nature and culture debate uh, which I feel has also to be contextualized uh, in the different culture that is the western culture and the non western culture. Now, uh, many sort of scholars or uh, works has been so far witnessed in trying to look at the differences between uh, the north and south divide and how the sort of the western oriented uh, capitalist uh, ideas are different from the sort of the oriental that is the east, the occidental and oriental division or perception of not just uh, nature, but how this belief and uh, when we talk about belief it is also about this uh, religion, the kind of practices which is being uh, witnessed and uh, through these practices or belief human tends to perceive nature in a different way. Now, mostly the western culture is being uh, sort of dominated by these uh, Christian beliefs and ideas and uh, if you look at the works of like Lynn White which I have uh, time and again mentioned in his work this the wherein he says this Christian religion is solely responsible for the ecological crisis because of their anthropocentric ideas that is uh, looking at the sort of the dominance of man over nature which is also pretty much applicable wherein this uh, where Strauss in a sense has argued about uh, the culture's dominance over nature. Now, when we talk about culture it is not just the sort of practices, but also the kind of perception, the belief, the set of things which we normally uh, use it in terms of perceiving things. Now, this sort of anthropocentric ideas which is pretty much embedded in the minds of uh, those western people in a way is to be sort of seen as how they sort of looked at or perceived at nature because they tend to sort of uh, looked at nature as something which has to be tamed and exploited and then wherein this some thing which is profitable has to be squeezed out to sort of satisfy the needs of human. Now, this sort of dominance over nature is persistent in the minds of the western culture. Now, uh, by saying so, if you look at some of the uh, religions in the south or east like uh, Buddhism, Hinduism and then uh, also even Jainism or maybe if you take the context of uh, in Japan they have this uh, religious I, uh, beliefs of the Shintoism. Now, if you look at all these religions, they in a way sort of uh, give a lot of respect or reverence to nature and then they believe in the uh, harmonious relationship between human and nature or rather culture and nature. Now, and uh, they, they in a sense uh, establish sort of a bio biocentric uh, ideas uh, by contextualizing them in this sort of physical world. Now, this sort of dichotomy between anthropocentrism and biocentrism can also be brought in when we discuss about the nature culture dichotomy and, and, and 
which is not just to be sort of generalized or universalized rather, but it has to be seen in the context of uh, that particular cultural context, how this human community perceive nature. Therefore, uh, this sort of uh, homogeneity in terms of uh, sort of branding uh, the relation between nature and culture needs to be relooked and reoriented, or rather, we, we need to really, you know, like uh, 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 reassert the kind of relations between this nature and culture. Now, some of the sort of universal argument which is being available in the con uh, in academia in a sense can be in the work of uh, Sherry Ortner, uh, wherein she wrote and I say is female to male as nature is to culture. Now, this sort of uh, a very apt you know like catchy term in a sense is mostly used by the feminists in trying to challenge if not or maybe uh, trying to look at uh, how women as is seen as a subordinate or seen to be inferior to man and then and, and uh, similarly this applies to what nature is to culture. Now, uh, interestingly Sherry Ortner makes two observation here that is in regard to relationship between nature and culture. Firstly, she sees culture as an, an entity that has the ability to act upon and transform nature. That is, uh, culture is pretty much instrumental in uh, trying to shape and reshape nature. Now, this culture again is something which uh, a human uh, or a community sort of uh, set of beliefs and ideas which they have over a period of time. Now, how do we see these changes or the sort of continuous continuity of this set of ideas? This is something which is important again and second, C also tries to equate the relationship of nature and culture to the universal devaluation of women. When we talk about devaluation of women, we are also trying to look at not just the nature culture relationship, but the political economy which exists across the globe. Now, the, the, the so called uh, feminist movement which sort of uh, began in the west, uh, if I may reflect uh, for us to have uh, an, a deeper understanding. The first feminist uh, movement uh, began in the West in the US and the more demand was sort of a universal suffrage that is the equal right to vote because uh, women were not counted as a full fledged citizen and they were denied this the voting rights. And uh, therefore, there are different trends of this feminist movement again and each time they come up with certain kind of uh, sort of uh, fighting for the rights of women. And, and uh, in, in many of the sort of the sort uh, Olympic and uh, certain games and sports, women were being denied a place. Today, like more or less, the sort of uh, equality, equality in terms of the representation. But in most cases, uh, if you look at the political aspect, the head of the state or normally of a country is mostly manned, and you lo at least uh, very few individual women which is taking part in politics today. Now. If you look at some of this data and the kind of understanding or the sort of issues which were being raised uh, in terms of uh, this idea of uh, universalization of rights, most often time 
women tends to raise that to raise this or object this idea of this devaluation. Why is women being devaluated or uh, why should they be given sort of an equal treatment like what uh, men usually experience. Now, this sort of understanding I feel that uh, Sari's Ortner, Sari Ortner's argument is sort of slightly uh, feminist in that aspect. And throughout her essay, uh, Ortner repeatedly professes uh, bold universals in trying discussing the sort of dichotomy which are which one might argue are generalizations such as the statement which uh, she gave. In every known culture, women is considered in some degree inferior to men. Th this sort of uh, a patriar patriarchal sort of uh, mental mentality which exists in every society is to be seen as perhaps the being responsible also in terms of the static or firm uh, dichotomy which exists between nature and culture. Now, in every known culture, women is considered in some degree inferior to men. Now, what is this particular uh, sort of uh, line then? How do we make sense to it? And if women is considered in some degree inferior to men, now where does the women stand and if women is to be equated with nature? We, we still uh, sort of feel that uh, uh, nature is inferior to culture and as long as this sort of inferiority or inequality existed, there can be no harmonious relationship in essence or sort of there won't be any uh, so, uh, universalizations of understanding. Now, therefore, this sort of uh, argument which is being posited by Ortner in her uh, essay uh, is also to be contextualized and understand the manner in which things that is nature is being perceived uh, across generations. And uh, are we really allowing these sort of uh, ideas or the ideologies which is spearheaded by mainly the male should be uh, sort of carried forward. This is something which we uh, need to ponder upon and look at. Now also as I said uh, Levi Strauss in a sense follows uh, the structuralist perspective and uh, when he theorized this structuralism, uh, Ortner in a sense believes that nature and culture are both uh, categories of human thought. Why? Because uh, there is no place out in the real world where one could find some actual boundary between the two state or realms of beings. Why is this? Because the sort of uh, boundaries, the differences between the real world and uh, some of the uh, understanding between these two uh, things cannot be sort of categorized. And uh, this human thought in a sense has also to be contextualized in this frame of reference that is uh, the structuralism. Now, Ortner in a sense uh, primarily focuses on the universality of rituals because an assertion in all human cultures uh, of the sort of special specifically human ability to act upon and uh, move by the givens of this natural existence. That is he, human ability, human has this capability to act and regulate rather than passively move with and be moved by the givens of natural existence. That is sort of a kind of challenges which is being spelled out by Ortner because a single step or a simple move can make a huge differences. So, this is something which 
she tries to look at by asserting a uh, sort of the human culture in terms of uh, the capability of human to sort of act and regulate and it has to be seen in that particular specific condition. Now, what does make this culture distinct? Why is culture to be seen as something pretty distinct and different? Now, Ordner again uh, defines culture specifically as this process of uh, transcendence, because uh, transcendence in a sense, because by means of systems of thought and technology of the sort of uh, natural givens of existence. Now, at some level, every culture incorporates this notion in the form or another and if only through uh, the performance of ritual as an assertion of the human ability to manipulate these those givens. Now, this human have that capability to sort of uh, manipulate all this uh, what is being given to them. Now, therefore, the, the sort of uh, system of thought on technology which has evolved over a period of time in a sense has to be understood in these processes. And therefore, culture is something as we said, uh, which sort of evolve and, and, uh, and that makes culture so much uh, special and then distinct from what nature is. Nature in a sense cannot evolve in itself, but rather culture can be. Therefore, uh, as a result of this, Culture is not only clearly distinct from nature in Ordner's view, but its ability to transform nature actually makes it superior. That is, by spelling out the real crux, if not the boundary which exists between nature and culture, and then maybe the superior position of culture, in a sense makes it more interesting because that culture has the potential to shape or if not transform nature and therefore, if culture acts well and then uh, have that sort of positive component, it has the ability to sort of carry alongside nature and then that sort of uh, a kind of uh, uh, continuity which exists, that harmonious relationship which exists can sort of continue. Now, but then often time this uh, culture dominates over nature and uh, according to Ortner, because it is identified nearly everywhere with men who often times occupy the higher position uh, to perform the task and rituals to create and sustain culture. Now, further uh, Ordner tries to uh, understand and argues that this the sort of uh, universal uh, devaluation of woman could be sort of explained by postulating the women which is seen as closer to nature or, or perhaps this sort of closer to nature is sort of uh, an imposition or maybe rather because women as are seen as inferior, which again as I uh, when I explained uh, how the sort of feminist tries to you know attack the uh, essentialist idea of this patriarchy and uh, where, wherein they are being seen to be soft, caring and uh, they are usually seen to be engaged in nurturing. Therefore, since uh, this particular feminine traits are being given to women are seen to be more close to nature than men and men in a sense can be seen as more uh, unequivocally occupying the high grounds of culture that is they are more superior and then they have this uh, capability of uh, controlling if not capturing nature. 
Now, this sort of ideas, uh, the universal devaluation of women, could be explained in this parlance. Now, this sort of understanding is pretty much uh, being uh, argued by Ortner, and also Ortner uh, asserts that they are generally viewed as more symbolic of nature than man. That is, women are generally viewed as more symbolic of nature than man. Now, uh, if you look at uh, apart from this closer to nature, maybe if you give contextualize it by giving the examples of the southern countries like uh, many of the third world countries, how women are closely associated or dependent on nature. Now, some of the works uh, which is uh, if you look at uh, the works of some uh, feminists, uh, they are trends which is normally uh, sort of how women are mostly affected when there is some kind of environmental destruction or changes occur because mostly uh, they are dependent on their natural surroundings like let us say water, forest, so on and so forth. Because why water? Because uh, the sort of responsibilities of uh, bringing this drinking water in a family again is the responsibility of a women. Now, there are places where a drought prone states where women actually walk miles to fetch uh, you know a pot of water. And in those cases, uh, it is really a threat if not more of an a tedious task for a women or if not uh, a double burden for them and uh, which is usually unaccounted and then not really seen by the man because they are seen to be more engaged into bringing the uh, sort of bread to the family. And also uh, one, uh, the works of uh, some uh, scholars like Vandana Shiva wherein she pointed out that uh, or women are more dependent on the neighboring forests like uh, collecting of those uh, non-timber forest products like fruits and then various other edible items and, all, and also these uh, NTFPs non-timber forest products are being sold in the nearby market in order to earn some kind of extra income. So, that sort of dependence which is pretty much seen in the context of many southern countries are to be highlighted and to looked at when we explain this how women are seen to be closer to nature. But by saying so that women are close to nature, but uh, uh, one cannot really rationalize by saying that they are in a sense more weaker if not inferior to men. This is something which uh, the misconceptions which evolve around. Now, this has to in a sense uh, as Ortner has argued uh, should be sort of re look at. Now, therefore, we have explained certain um, important points and these several reasons are in a sense uh, given because women's uh, sort of direct bodily involvement with reproductions or with her assigned socialized roles lives are within the confines of the subordinate domestic household. Now, the, this sort of uh, branding if not the position which women or the works which they engage upon into in a sense uh, uh, inevitably put her into this subordinate positions. And also Ortner clarifies that in reality while examining a woman in a biological sense, she is not closer to nature at all than man because since both are mortal beings with consciousness as if man is immortal and woman is mortal. So, this sort of uh, you know understanding has to be uh, re -looked at. But when uh, examining a woman as something less powerful even if 
non-existent role in cultures, ritual as her focus on child rearing tasks, she appears that way. Because by being uh, caring and nurturing doesn't mean that one is seen to be sort of soft and inferior. Rather, it can be seen otherwise because that sort of strength and uh, uh, ability has to be sort of relook and then re-examined. Now, women, according to Ortner, are sort of the primary agents of socialization for children, transforming them from a mere organism to a cultural human, uh, teaching it manners and the sort of proper ways to behave in order to be a bona fide member of the culture. Now, this sort of uh, discourse, which, which is uh, sort of to be seen, how women actually is responsible for grooming and then uh, perhaps she is the, uh, the mothers usually is the first teacher for a child or a person before they really go into the formalist kind, formalist kind of uh, education. Now, therefore, this has to be seen uh, from that perspective. Now, uh, on that function alone, Ortner in a, in a sense says that women should be uh, seen as a symbol of culture just as equally as men. Now, they should not be seen as something uh, which is inferior to women. Now, this sort of uh, the dominant psychic modes of uh, relating would incline her into entry into a more uh, a relationship with the world that culture might see as being more like nature, immanent and embedded in things as given. Now, Ortner finally makes her view on the how women should be viewed in nature, culture divide, how women should be contextualized in this nature culture divide. She writes that both men and women give up her role of raising and socializing children in culture can be seen as active members of culture. Only then will women easily be seen as aligned with culture in cultures ongoing dialectic with nature. Therefore, uh, one should give sort of a, a rightful position or a deserving position to women and therefore, uh, they has to be contextualized in this divide between nature and culture. And then finally, the critics which is again given by this Marilyn Stratton and uh, which noted that nature and culture have penetrated so deeply into the cultural analysis and therefore, the anthropologists are engaged into we regard their opposition as something which is inevitable that is natural. And in her essay again the works no nature no culture the Hagen case. Stratton writes that nature and culture are two concepts that are highly relative whose meaning come from a specific ideology and Stratton states that there is no such thing as uh, nature or culture and there is no single meaning, uh, no single meaning can in fact be given to nature or culture in western thought. There is no consistent dichotomy on the matrix of contrast. Now, C continues by sort of trying to challenge or question how lars the to total assembly of all meanings uh, sort of prescribed to the nature culture divide might be that we must be able to identify in other culture to speak with confidence of their having such kind of notions. Now, I uh, finish here with the sort of the nature culture debate and then we will try to look in a more uh, sort of anthropological understanding or perspective further in the next lecture and these are some of the references for further reading. Thank you.